I'm Adriana Stone. I'm Erica Moore. I'm Richard Sansa. I'm Quinn Jarecki. And we're lab group 6A, and this is lab 4, optimal beam, co beam collimation and testing radius of curvature. <laughs> In the pre-lab, we designed a beam expander which takes a laser with a 0.4 millimeter waist and expands it to fill the 40 millimeter clear aperture of the collimation lens. The beam expander we designed in this lab consists of a 9mm focal length objective lens, 12.9 micron spatial filter, and a 2 inch diameter, 500mm focal length collimating lens with a convex side toward the collimated space to reduce spherical collaboration. Due to availability of parts, we used a 15 micron spatial filter and a 450mm focal length collimation lens. As with last week, we determined the necessary components by using the ratio of the expanded beam to the initial beam waste times the focal length of our objective. As we saw last week, the shear plate is a simple division of amplitude interferometer which can tell us about the divergence or convergence of a beam. The shear plate is a high quality window where the beams reflected at the front and back surfaces interfere at the viewing plane. The extra distance traveled by the beam reflecting off the back surface introduces an optical path difference. In an unwedged shear plate, the two faces of the window are parallel, so the OPD across the interfering region due to inter inter the interferometer is constant. For a well collimated beam, this would result in a uniform intensity across the field. We used a wedge shear plate where the two faces are not parallel but offset by a small angle. This introduces an OPD between the two beams, even when the input is collimated, so we still see fringes. This wedge property also causes the fringes to change orientation when the input beam is converging or diverging. When we use the shear plate, we measure the shear distance, the spacing of the fringes, and the angle of the fringes with respect to the reference line on the viewing screen. From these three parameters, we can calculate the radius of curvature of the wavefront at the viewing plane, according to the equation on this slide. Here we present sketches of the three experimental layouts used. Generally speaking, the shear plate allows us to measure the radius of curvature of optical wavefronts, allowing us to determine the radii and respective powers of our optics. To determine the focal length of a low power mirror, a large aperture wedge shear plate is placed into the system between the beam expander and the low power mirror. The shear plate causes the beam reflecting off of the mirror to separate into two separate beams that interfere at the viewing screen. With the fringe spacing and the divergence angle from the central line, we measured, we calculate the focal length of the mirror to be 3.9 meters. This was calculated by adding the measured radius at the shear plate observation screen summed with the distance between the observation screen and the mirror. Next, we tested the low power lens. To approximate the lo a low power lens, we used a combination of a positive and negative lens of similar power so that they would sum to a lower power. Unfortunately, the positive lens we had to use was utterly smashed. Despite this, we persevered and used a V-groove mount to hold a single shard of what was once a lens in place. This worked in terms of power, but because it was far from a circular clear aperture, our shear distance measurement was expectedly off. We measure the radius of curvature of this wavefront to be 54 meters. However, this is probably inaccurate due to the irregular shear distance. With the higher power mirror, we place the mirror in two places along the optical rail. The first is a cat's eye position where the reference lens focuses onto the surface of the mirror. The second is where we move beyond that focal point to the location where the radius of curvature of the wavefront and the radius of curvature of the mirror match. The first location was easy enough to find because we could see the focus spot on the surface of the mirror. The second location was much harder to find because the aberrations in the wavefront meant that it was difficult to tell when the appropriate fringes were present. However, we were able to look at the plane of the spatial filter to help us. If the wavefront curvature is matched to the radius of curvature of the mirror, then the beam should exactly propagate the same way that it came. Therefore, we can tell that we are close when we see the focus spot reflected back onto the plane of the spatial filter. Here, we measure the wavefront to be, have a radius of curvature of 49.5 centimeters. The direction that the fringes rotate is related to whether the wedge angle is negative or positive. In order to check this in our shear plate, we needed to send a beam of known convergence or divergence into our shear plate. If our high power mirror is in front of the wavefront curvature match position, the image point is in front of the object, so it's inside the focal length of the reference lens. This means that the output is diverging. When we move the mirror through the curvature match position, the image point moves beyond the focal point of the reference, so the beam is converging. As we moved in this direction from diverging to converging, we saw that the fringes rotated clockwise. Based on our observations, for a diverging beam to cause clockwise rotation, the wedge angle has to be positive.